Okay, good evening, everybody. It is seven o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I appreciate everybody taking some time to join us for our uh, March Area Leader webinar. Um, we've been having a lot of webinars uh, recently, so uh, always appreciate the time that you take uh, to help grow our program. So, um, really quickly, um, just as a reminder, um, looking ahead to the rest of the year, um, we have a webinar scheduled for July 13th and the next meeting uh, July 18th and then our November meeting um, with webinar on the 9th and meeting on the 14th. So those were confirmed at the last area directors meeting. Um, I will make sure that registration links get put in the next um, area memo that goes around. So um, you can certainly uh, sign up for those early. Moving on, we've had some staffing updates uh, since our last area directors meeting in November. So we wanna welcome Joanne Engler, our VP Finance, uh, who joined the team just before the holidays. Well, I guess just after the holidays, actually in, in January. Um, and we're gonna be hearing from her in a little bit. Ben Varga, who um, some of you have been able to meet um, at Winter Games is our new Healthy Communities Manager. As you remember, we received the Healthy Communities Grant through Special Olympics International, and that allowed us to bring on a staff member focused on health and fitness in our program. So we are excited um, that Ben joined our team um, just after the plunge. So uh, I think February 1st, or just about that was his first day. Um, and then Julie Oltman, who many of you have known in a few positions, um, she started on our team as um, our donor relations coordinator, then she moved into the director of communications uh, position for the past year um, and uh, has now shifted into her new position or her new role as our director of grants, foundations, and research. So um, as you start to work on your local program grants um, and any um, partnerships with foundations, Julie is there um, to assist you. She's not new to our team. Um, but this is a new position for her. And then the current postings that we currently have um, is our administrative receptionist. For those of you who remember, um, Tammy, um, she left a little bit before the holidays. Um, and uh, after some, you know, considering what this position could look like, um, Rhonda and Jim have been working hard to, um, to recruit some SOMD athletes um, to take on this position and to apply for it. So uh, we're currently in the interview process there, I believe. Um, obviously with current circumstances, things are um, a little different, probably a little slower, not sure um, start date there, but um, we are looking for qualified SOMD athletes um, to apply for that position. Um, and we are uh, looking forward to hopefully adding um, another athlete to our team. Adam Hayes is an athlete out of Frederick County. He's on our team currently. Um, and we're looking to add uh, some more, so we're excited about that. And speaking of athlete leadership, um, we're gonna kick things off with Jason. Um, so Jason, I'm gonna unmute your line, um, and I'm gonna keep control of the slides. Uh, so just tell me when you want me to advance. So Jason, you're unmuted. Thank you, Jeff, appreciate it. So um, just wanted to give a couple uh, updates on the athlete leadership uh, front. So I think we can advance the slide on this one. Uh, just a quick recap for everybody. Uh, we went through our numbers to make sure uh, that we were accurate in our assessments of the year. Uh, and as you can see in front of you, we had uh, at year end, uh, a total number of athlete leadership opportunities was our highest number ever at 3,452. If we count our IUS program, you can see that number goes above 7,700, which, uh, which is a great number. Uh, and uh, a couple other things to point out is that uh, we uh, were able to utilize the skills and talents of over 500 athletes, unique athletes. So these were athletes who did one or more of our events uh, and uh, Obviously, if you have 3,452, uh, <laughs> there's athletes who do multiple events. Uh, but through uh, your hard work and, and the work of uh, the staff at, at Special Olympics Maryland, uh, we were able to identify 502 athletes who had an opportunity to show leadership in the community. So we're really uh, pleased with that number as well. Number of unique events that we had throughout the year was 476, where athletes had a chance to have their skills shine. 
Uh, and we use this uh, kind of second to last number, um, the points of light foundation values, um, the uh, an hour of volunteer service or uh, at around $24 and I think it's 72 cents or 74 cents. Uh, so with the athletes giving back in various leadership positions, uh, just shy of 3,000 hours, uh, they had a, a, a volunteer a value of uh, just over $74,000 to the organization. Uh, and if we look at um, the hard and soft credits, that number is actually the, uh, the uh, total of money raised by athletes, uh, whether it's through plunge, over the edge, inspiration walks. Um, so athletes in Special Olympics Maryland have not just given back hours to Special Olympics Maryland, but uh, raised money for the organization uh, to a value of $177,000 plus. So uh, those, are, those are really impressive numbers. And uh, we think that 2019 really was our best year. And we appreciate all the work that you guys have done to, uh, to contribute towards that. So thank you. And Jason, I just want to cut in before we move to the next slide. So these numbers are, are great and, um, and absolutely uh, representative of our state athlete leadership numbers, as well as all of the local program numbers that we know of. Um, but we also know that there's probably a lot out there that goes unreported. Um, so just as Joanne and Darlene and, and Maureen have been contacting you about in-kind donations, please contact Jason after events when you have athlete leadership opportunities or if you had athletes raise money um, as part of a plunge team or inspiration walk so we can count every single hour and every single athlete um, who's involved in our athlete leadership program. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so I just, uh, we also break this out uh, by uh, the number of opportunities that are related to counties. And so in alphabetical order, uh, you can see at the end of 2019, uh, kind of where the county programs, uh, where the numbers are with the county programs. So uh, gives you an idea. We're uh, we're pretty active in a lot of counties, uh, and uh, and then we have some work to do in a few others, uh, and that's just. Um, some of the work that, that uh, we need to do collectively is, uh, is some recruitment and some training. Uh, and I look forward to, to working with all of you to, uh, to kind of move that forward and give more athletes the opportunity. Uh, so that number in 2020 uh, is, uh, is well above the 3452 that we see at the bottom there. I think that's it, Jeff. That is, thanks Jason. Um, and as always, um, Jason's been a great resource. I know he spent um, a few evenings in the uh, pretty recently visiting area management team meetings, um, going out to different counties to do training. So um, Jason and his role as our VP athlete leadership can definitely uh, be a resource as we talked about at our last area directors meeting. Be in touch with him, let him know how he can best support your local program um, in growing athlete leadership. Um, in your county. So Jason, thanks for being on. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. And uh, moving right along, we're going to uh, hear from our new VP Finance, Joanne. Uh, so this is Joanne's uh, first uh, AD webinar. So Joanne, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And just as we did with Jason, just let me know when I should advance. Great. Thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. Uh, welcome this evening, everyone on this uh, webinar this evening. My name is Joanne Engler. I come to um, Special Olympics Maryland from a career in the nonprofit organization arena industry. Uh, I've been doing nothing but nonprofit my whole life, and I'm really excited to be with Special Olympics. Um, and I hope uh, myself and my team can help you in any way. Uh, please um, contact one of us if you have questions. We we're, we're here to help you. Um, so let's dive into a, a few slides that we have for this evening. Jeff? Jeff? There we go. Thank you. Okay, so today I'm just going to touch on a few items. Um, we'll take a quick look at the state finances for um, fiscal year 2019, also local programs for 2019, uh, a little bit on the plunge. Uh, and then some comments about um, bank deposits and a reminder about in-kind. Yeah. Okay, so 
Uh, these numbers, you uh, please know these are pre-audit numbers. Our, audit, our auditors don't come out until April. So these are um, where they stand now. Doesn't mean that this is where they're gonna end, but we don't expect any large adjustments. Um, the bottom line for the state um, is that we didn't quite make our, rev our um, budget this year. Um, got close. But most of the area that was um, that we struggled with this year had to do with individual giving. And that has a lot to do with our telemarketing vendor heritage, which some of you may or may not know, went out of business at the end of 2019. We did budget less this year in that arena. Uh, I don't know if that's because we had an inkling that there may have been some issues, but in the end, the company went out of business and the individual giving that we expected to have in that area, we didn't quite get um, to our goal, but we got close. Um, we did get more grants and uh, grant money than we expected last year, which is wonderful to help fund some of our programs. Um, the plunge, as you know, always crosses fiscal years, um, but our plunge experience in 2020, we know was fabulous. Um, we raised more money this year than we did last year, and we see that in the revenue area. We also added the gala last year in 2019, which we'll repeat in 2020, which is great, adds to the revenue. And then other between um, pluses and minuses, other pretty much broke even. On the expense side, we had some savings and salaries, uh, benefits and taxes from staff turnover. That's a normal, we usually see that in most nonprofits, there's turnover. Um, and that, but it, we're, almost, we're almost on target, it's pretty good. Athletic events, um, I, IUS sports had more expenses and summer games slightly less, not, very, not, not too much of a variance. And then um, the other items, um, the only other item of, of note under plunge, we know that with a um, bigger event, sometimes we have bigger expenses, but also the timing of when invoices for expenses come in whether they come in in the one fiscal year or the other fiscal year, sometimes we'll make our uh, budget expectation different than what the actual was. And then in other fundraising events, as we saw that we had more revenue from the gala, we also have expenses from the gala. So the big, the big contributor there was the gala. But overall, not too, not too terribly bad. I think you had a very good year in the state. Are there any questions on the, on the state? Okay, so let's uh, move to the area. Okay, so the, in the area program, again, this is pre-audit 2019, um, revenues and expenses, and you guys had a banner year. If you take in, in total, uh, you exceeded your budget by almost $500,000, that's awesome. And um, investments this year have done very well barring the stock market recently in 2019, which has helped support the, the different areas in their um, expenditures. Um, just some highlights. Um, we know that um, there have been, we've got some revenues this past year that we weren't expecting. Um, Harford County um, increased their revenues from grants and memorial gifts, which is awesome. Um, in Howard County, also did very, very well. Um, more revenue expenses. So fundraising, it, fundraising, it looks like across the board, it's been really well. Um, folks have really been out there um, with the program and raising money with our local constituency. So you all should pat yourself on the back. It's really good numbers and some fundraising. Um, there's still a few areas where um, there's some struggling, but it looks like, um, May, may or may, you know, some are very close, some a little bit uh, farther away, but I think with some uh, focus on revenue, gaining more revenue in the upcoming year and looking at our expenses to make sure we're being efficient in what we're doing, we might be able to reduce some of the deficit that we see here. Are there any um, questions about the area program? We don't have any in the chat, um, but that's a good reminder, everybody. If you do have questions as we go, feel free to 
um, place them in the chat box and we'll read them and, and hit them as we go. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So I wanted to show this graph to everyone. I really like this graph because it, it tells a good story in a very visual way. This graph looks at fund statistics from the 2015 fund through the 2020 fund. And I think that there's a couple things on here that are really important. Number one, when we're doing our events, it's very important that the expense over revenue percentage is, stays um, low. Our, right now, when we look at our different events, our percentage of expense over revenue is kind of on the high side when compared to other um, organizations in our industry. So one of the things that I know I'm gonna be looking at and helping folks with is how do we have nice quality events, but be able to make sure that that expense over revenue ratio stays down. And as we can see, when you're looking at the green line, in 2020, the plunge was fantastic. We had a great event. Everyone had a good time, high quality and we've been able to hold that expense line pretty flat, which means the percentage between expenses and revenue is going down, and that's a very good sign. That's awesome. The other thing you can see that is very prominent on this slide is between 2019 and 2020, the uptick in revenue, which is the top line, and part of that uptick is because the um, organization changed the website software where people could log on and do their donating for the plunge. And that change, we believe, really contributed to this steep line that we see here. And then, of course, the expenses as a percentage of revenue are going down. So that nice wide difference between the expenses and the revenues give us that net revenue line in the middle, which is ticking up. That is awesome. And this, and of course, the plunge is one of the events that contributes to our goal of raising more fun funding for our athletes so we can expand our program over time. So this, this is awesome. I, uh, this is an awesome slide. Um, you guys should be really proud of it. And again, the plunge being a combination of both what the area, what the areas are contributing towards plunge, what the state is doing, all of that contributes to our ability to have a great program for more and more athletes. Jeff? So a couple of reminders. I know um, finance isn't everybody's bailiwick, but uh, it excites me, it's something I really like to do. So I wanna make a reminder that has to do with bank deposits. Um, it's very important that um, deposits of donations and contributions are taken to the bank at least monthly, you know, preferably before the end of the month. And that has to do with recording, which I'll come back to. Um, continue to send your copies of deposits to Darlene so she can record them. Um, that process seems to be working really well, but not always as timely as I think we could, um, that we should be doing. I think we can improve in that area. Um, areas are doing a great job fundraising, but when donations are received, the expectation from the donor is that the program's in need. We're going out into the community and we're saying, we need funds to run our program. So. If we're holding on to donations and we're not putting them into the bank, two things are happening. Number one, the donor's check, if they're giving us a check, isn't clearing the bank right away. So then, you know, is the donor thinking we don't need the funds? And the other is through that process of recording, then the donor gets thanked. So if we're holding on to the checks for a month or two months, then that thank you to the donor is delayed. So I think if we want to keep improving our process for raising funds and talking to donors. We also need to be timely on our bank deposits. The other part of that, again, as I said, I'll go back to recording, is we want to tell our story accurately. So monthly financial reporting is a reflection of everything that we did during that month. So if, our, if we don't have all the deposits in, then at information is missing from our finance reports, and then our finance reports aren't exactly correct. So if you need any assistance on deposits or anything that has to do with that, please reach out to the finance team. They'll be very happy to help you. And I wanna give you an example, just so you understand what I'm asking, is that in February, so just a couple weeks ago, 
Um, the state office received a copy of a deposit that was made on, in the area. So the deposit was made by an area staff person. And it was, that deposit was made in January. So they, we got, um, at the headquarters, we got it in February. It was a January donation. And when I flipped through that donation, there were checks from donors in there from November, December, and January. So those donors didn't get thanked until February. So I think it would be something I'd like to really work with area directors is let's try to get our bank deposits from our donors in sooner so that they can be thanked and that we have accurate records in the headquarters for all of the areas. So your help in that regard would be great. So if anybody has any questions about that, again, please reach out to the finance team. Thanks, Jeff. Next one. Okay, and then lastly, and we've already kind of touched on this a little bit, is the in-kind donation documentation that's submitted to Maureen every month uh, is not consistent. Um, and one of the reasons that we ask area directors to either do it every month or at the end of when an event is completed is because our memories, is, even though we believe our memories are great, it's hard to remember what in-kind donations we got if we do all, all, all of our in-kind donation paperwork once a year. So we have forms that are available so that folks can, when an event is done or you get to the end of the month, fill out these little forms about what's been given to us in donations so that we can keep track during the year. We get a lot of in-kind donations from the community and we really truly want to make sure that we record them all and that they're, they, that the value, and that they're valued into our financial um, records. Remember that the valuation of an in-kind donation is determined by the donor. It is not determined by us. We don't do that. Um, the valuation is valued by the donor. So it's very important that that, that backup, that paperwork, that communication back to um, the headquarters is from the donor. And, for, uh, and of course, for audit purposes, it's important that we have it all. So I know that there's a couple areas that I've reached out to that I haven't heard back from. Um, if folks could please take you know, uh, sometime this week to finish up those pieces. I'd really appreciate it. That would be really helpful. And I think that's everything from finance. Awesome, thanks Joanne and thanks for being with us. Um, <clears throat> just like we said with Jason, if people have um, questions that they weren't able to get into the chat uh, bubble here, um, please feel free to um, reach out. Um, Bob, actually, Bob Baker asked a question. Um, Joanne, I'm not sure if you would know this one. How much do we pay for insurance? Um, Off the top of my head, I don't know that answer, um, but I can find out that answer. Um, we have, you know, we have various kinds of insurance, commercial, umbrella, et cetera. So, um, Bob, if you, if, you have, if you need it more general, that would be great. If you need a specific kind of um, insurance, I can work with Rhonda and get that information for you. Thanks, Joanne. Um, and Bob, second question, um, I will take, you have the county uh, plunge breakouts. Um, yes, we do. Uh, we'll go over that in the development part. We'll highlight a few, but then I'll be able to send those totals out because um, they were just finalized. Um, so that'll be coming soon. Um, Marilyn Maselli had a question. Marilyn's from Howard County, Joanne, um, regarding in-kind donations. Um, you said that the value is determined by the donor, but if we get a receipt, we can see the, we can see yes. the value. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, if you, you know, yes, if you have a receipt, yes, that's fine. Cool, thanks. Um, any other questions to, for Joanne? Awesome. All right. Well, Joanne, thanks for being your webinar in the books. Way to go. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll talk to you all later. Awesome. All right. I'm going to sign off. Cool. I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to go down and uh, Mike, I think you are up next. So once I find you on the list, I'm going to go ahead and Mike, you're unmuted now. Oh, great. Thank you. Yep. Uh, sure. And Jeff, just as a heads up, uh, we're going to start out with Steve, uh, oh. and then uh, towards the tail end, we'll have Mac. So, um, Steve, you want to handle this first slide that he's going to, not, not this beautiful sports slide, but the, 
the next one he's going to click to. Steve, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Jeff. Actually, if you go back, I can say that title slide just says sports, and uh, whoever put that together did an excellent <laughs> job, so thank you for that. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Uh, good to talk with everyone this evening. Uh, this is just a quick update um, as we, uh, the three counties that we're dealing with in regards to the 21 World Winter Games. Um, there's still some unknown factors going on there, but we do have some information with the 2022 uh, USA Games. Uh, so we know where those are going to be. Hopefully everyone is aware that they're in Orlando. And right now, we've determined through advice and, and in talks internally, basically, that the qualifying events for the USA Games in 2022 will start with our kayaking state championships um, coming up this summer. And then we'll conclude with next year's summer games. <clears throat> so the sports um, that will be offered in Orlando – um, we don't have anything officially stating what sports will be offered, uh, nor do we have information in regards to when the quota request will go to North America. Um, and then also following that, when we will be notified of what allotments we do receive uh, based on the request that we submit. So basically, it's, it's a big slide and a lot of information to say, if we get kayaking competition slots, we will get them from this year and then moving through the fall season. Those sports, again, ending with summer games of next year will be the events in which we will take advancement criteria from in order to put Team Maryland together. And once we get more information as far as dates and timelines and what sports will be offered, uh, we'll definitely share that information with each of you. Great. Uh, actually, if we can go to the next slide, that touches on the World Winter Games, which uh, Steve already uh, mentioned. Um, the one thing that we do know, or two things that we do know, is one, it's not going to be held in the first quarter of 2021, um, which means uh, if it is held in 2021, it'll probably be in the fourth quarter, uh, unless they go to the, uh, um, the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and then also reportedly, uh, we don't have any more information on who this or where this host location is, uh, but supposedly there is a proposal before the SOI Board of Directors uh, for that. Uh, the other thing, just as an update um, with Winter Games, um, as we've collected information and gotten feedback from folks and we're having some uh, conversations, or we had uh, site visiting conversations with WISP um, as a potential um, uh, new location or returning location, um, uh, we're working with a... Uh, um, uh, a proposal uh, format for them and uh, um, we'll again get additional information uh, and additional feedback as we have more concrete information such as things on uh, anticipated costs uh, and so on down the line. So just wanted to touch on that. You can go to the next slide. Uh, I wanted to touch on um, a couple things that we'll talk about at the area directors meeting and then following that uh, some information on a couple programs that while I know things are a little bit in hiatus at the moment, um, given the, uh, the current situation, just be aware of what's available and when things do come, uh, do renew uh, or begin again, uh, you'll, you'll be primed and ready to go. Uh, so first of all, um, the uh, Special Mixed Maryland Conduct, Maryland Conduct Committee, and uh, thank you, I guess, uh, to all the area conduct committees uh, who have been, um, uh, doing well and working with Jeff on, uh, uh, or Tyler or Mike uh, or Pat uh, on uh, the issues that are there. Uh, we, of course, at the state level have uh, the SOMD Conduct Committee. Um, we're going through some rotation and some changes there. Uh, Mike Myers uh, is rotating off. Uh, Mike had originally been on that, uh, on that team as uh, an area director and coach role um, and now that he's on staff, it's uh, appropriate for him to step back off. Uh, and then similarly, Steve has been on there uh, in the games management team member role with a designated slot in the policy. Um, and we want to try to uh, cut back a little bit in terms of the number of staff members. So we're going to have Steve rotate off. And then I am absolutely thrilled <laughs> with the two new members uh, with this configuration of the team. Uh, and that is Marva Davis and Shelly Bogaski are coming on board. Um, for the conduct committee, 
um, given the nature of the, the things that it does and such, uh, we go through a uh, selection process, an internal selection process, as do uh, several of the um, board committees. When we talk about the, uh, the sports committee, um, which I'll just go to it now with the, um, later in the, uh, the slide deck though, uh, we're going through a nomination process with that. Given the nature though of the conduct committee and the issues that it addresses, we thought it best to go through and, uh, and make a selection. So the current membership are the five folks that are there. Um, luckily, uh, three of the uh, five members, Anna uh, McCauley, who's continuing in her role on the committee, Marva and Shelley can fill um, two or three of the uh, designated spots other than uh, the one that I have as chair and the one that Jim has as the CEO. Uh, Jeff, you can go to the next uh, slide. One of the things that we'll be talking about at the um, area directors meeting on Saturday are um, some proposed changes that we are putting forward to the board of directors to consider to the policy. First, and I think we mentioned this uh, a couple of these back but, um, uh, at the November meeting, but we have a little bit more meat around them. Uh, first is the membership, uh, that's to add a staff member um, who's responsible for risk management. That's one role that we don't have. In addition, looking to add an athlete, um, but the, with the caveat that it, it would only be when we have an athlete who is both appropriate for the role uh, and the responsibility as well as willing to do so. Um, uh, we think that there are several athletes uh, who, who could serve in this type of a role. It's a little bit different than most other leadership roles. Uh, and we want to be sure that uh, we don't um, kind of put ourselves in a box. And if there's not an athlete who's available um, and interested and appropriate, that we don't just put a, uh, a figurehead, if you will, or a, uh, what are, a, a person on there just to have to check off that box. So we're putting that caveat there. We also looked at our composition and uh, at least at this point in time, potentially for quite some while, uh, we didn't have anybody who was actually a family member on the, uh, the team and we wanna try to resolve that. Um, with Shelly joining, that takes care of uh, one, but we could also have potentially a family member um, who is uh, separate from, you know, uh, they're just because they are a family member uh, and uh, we'll look at that. Uh, and then because of that potential change, it may happen that we don't have an odd number of participants. So we've agreed that we're gonna shift to uh, myself as the chair, uh, only voting in those cases uh, where it would um, uh, break a tie. Uh, which is sort of a standard situation on a lot of organizations. So that's one proposal. The second uh, is on um, filing appeals. Uh, one of the things that we um, observed many months ago is uh, given our current policy, um, there's no reason not to file an appeal <laughs> if you don't like what the area uh, conduct committee or any other committee uh, decided. Um, there's, you know, hey, there's, there's no reason not to file an appeal uh, to get a second bite at the apple, if you will. Uh, and there's really nothing to say that we can refuse an appeal. Um, and we've had a couple appeals that probably would not have moved forward had we had some type of a policy on this. So we're, um, uh, we use Jeff's expertise uh, in this arena uh, in colleges in terms of student conduct and that type of thing. And so we're, we're proposing, and we wanna get your feedback on this on Saturday, so give some thought to it is uh, having three situations where um, an appeal could be filed and it would be at the discretion of the committee as to whether we would accept um, the appeal as something that we would hear. Uh, the three situations being, at first, that there's, there's new information that wasn't available uh, when the local conduct committee uh, uh, reviewed the situation and that that new information uh, could reasonably have affected the outcome. Um, not that they just found something new and it, it wouldn't necessarily have affected that. So we have that caveat. Second, if the, uh, the local conduct committee um, didn't follow the proper procedures and that, uh, that failure to follow the procedures adversely affected the outcome. Um, you know, certainly we should all be following the procedures properly uh, and such. In some cases, a failure to follow the procedure really has no impact on the outcome. Uh, but if it does, if it, uh, if it did, an example would be uh, failure to have a, uh, or provide the, uh, the individual the opportunity to address 
the area committee um, before imposing a suspension. Um, that's specifically spelled out as a requirement. That would be one where we probably would take the, uh, the appeal. Uh, and then the third would be if the severity of the sanctions isn't consistent with the severity of the offense. And again, that would be in the judgment of the committee. Um, in addition, uh, and this is just, uh, this came up just recently. Um, we find that there is a, um, I won't say there's a gap in terms of the, uh, uh, the points under the coach's code of conduct, um, but it, it would be helpful to clarify. Uh, and so we're proposing adding an additional bullet uh, at the second or third slot um, that says, I will not use my role as a coach or leader within Special Olympics to unduly influence athletes, family members, or others in an inappropriate manner or for personal benefit. Uh, I'm not going to go into what triggered this, but there was a recent situation where um, uh, it would have been helpful to have that more clearly spelled out. I'll just leave it at that. And so we're putting that forward. Um, uh, within the, the committee or within the policy. So again, the board, it's as a policy, the board needs to vote on all these, but we do want to get your additional information. So please, when Jeff sends the slides out uh, between now and Saturday, uh, speak to whomever you think is most appropriate within your county uh, and um, uh, to get input and, and we'll be looking to hear uh, thoughts on these as well. So Jeff, we'll hey, go to the next. Mike, we did have we did have one question pop up for Marilyn, um, just to clarify, uh, in terms of the the member. Oh, thank you. Sure. Um, um, yeah, I see the I see the. Great. The okay. Marilyn's asking about whether these are permanent spots or whatever. Thank you, Marilyn. I skipped right over that. One of the things we did address, uh, and we also addressed with the uh, the sports committee as well, is you're sort of have been on there for life, <laughs> whether you want to or not. Uh, and so we are building in uh, some type of a rotation uh, and uh, we'll, we'll work out the details on that. I don't know that that's anything that has to be within the, uh, the policy itself, but yes, we would be looking very likely three-year terms. Uh, and um, again, the key thing uh, for the athlete is um, again, given uh, I'm, 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 there's certainly a confidentiality component, but it's more a matter of, of to a certain degree sitting in judgment and that can be a, it can be stressful for those of us who are on the committee and aren't athletes. Um, it could certainly be um, stressful and it's really looking for that unique person. So, um, uh, and then also her question about the same uh, county, uh, actually the standard is if the, um, uh, if the case before the uh, committee is a, um, uh, involves one of the counties, uh, that individual steps off uh, for in some cases uh, where we're able to, we'll get an alternate uh, person to sit in. As an example, there was a, a recent case involving Baltimore County that Anna uh, stepped off uh, uh, for that one case um, and such. And it would be the same for uh, regardless of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the person's role in the committee uh, that we would step off or have that person step off. Okay. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Jeff, next slide. So we'll talk about that also, as I'm sure folks are thinking, uh, and we have been um, struggling with, um, uh, you know, the, the, the situation with COVID-19. Um, there's a reasonable chance, I think a high likelihood, that it's not going to be resolved by March 31st. Would be wonderful if that was the case, um, but just, you know, let's be realistic on that. But what we don't know is when. Uh, and how long that's going to stretch out. So we do need to start thinking about um, uh, summer games and the sum and the sports seasons for the five sports with summer games: track, swimming, bocce, softball, and cheerleading. Um, when we talk about summer games, um, there are, uh, in general, there are four potential options or or outcomes that that could be realized. Uh, one is it's held as, as planned on the weekend that it is scheduled and with uh, all the accoutrements and so on down the line there. Uh, second is that we move it to another date um, and is otherwise held as planned or pretty close to it. We've had some conversations with Towson University and uh, that's not outside the realm of possibility. Uh, there's nothing definite on that, but that is a potential option. Third is potentially moving it later. Uh, and split it into um, one-day competitions by sport. We say five one-day competitions. 
certainly some of them could be held at the same time or co-located if the facility allows. Um, uh, of course, we would abbreviate the events and such, but uh, there's always a possibility we can get the sports facility, but not the lodging uh, and such. And then the, the fourth, um, hopefully um, not one that comes to pass, but it's certainly something we need to consider, and that is that the summer games would be completely canceled. Um, so the questions um, with that in mind, and, and we need to keep in mind, as I'm sure all of you do, that Special Olympics Maryland, Special Olympics overall, is a sports training and competition uh, program. Uh, and so we need to be sure, uh, should we decide that we can hold summer games in some format, um, that the athletes have, have gotten uh, and have received the adequate training, appropriate training, may not be a full eight weeks, but it would need to be um, what we would consider adequate. Uh, and also that there is some competition, that, that coming to summer games is not their first competition, um, not just for the purpose of getting scores, but also, um, you know, there should be a competitive experience leading up to the event. So I've kind of gotten to four questions that I think will help us frame the issue and get feedback from uh, area leadership as one source of information leading to uh, uh, a decision um, when we can make a decision. So first, um, if we move summer games beyond uh, June 7th, um, how long could your area uh, continue to have training, offer training in, those, uh, in the sports that you offer? So if I'm making this up, if we moved it to June 30th or whatever that weekend might be, could you be in a position to continue training up until that time? Or if we move to July, um, you know, there's uh, um, any possibility there. We realize that that's not uh, necessarily um, something that every area could do, but want to find out, get your input on that. Second, um, and this is a hypothetical, uh, if we authorize and permitted um, you to do training uh, under the, the newly announced, I think it was today, of uh, no event larger than 50, um, that the, uh, the governor has, has wisely put in place. We're not trying to circumvent it, but uh, some training programs are much smaller than that. Um, uh, and uh, and that supposedly that's in place for eight weeks. Um, if we said, given that and given advice from Special Olympics overall, if we said, go ahead and start training once uh, that's in place, would you actually uh, do it? Um, uh, and that's not a challenge. There's all sorts of issues that come into play but want to get your feedback on that because that, again, would have come into play with this. Um, also, what's an acceptable, in your mind, uh, acceptable minimum amount of training and competition prior to some game, summer games, given this truly extraordinary situation? Um, again, standard is eight weeks. Uh, I don't think that's realistic, um, even in the best uh, scenario, unless everything stops on or it goes back to normal on March 31st or, or April 1st, which is not terribly likely. Um, and then finally, what's an acceptable time frame for us to make a decision on this issue? We certainly want to make sure we give every opportunity uh, to have a successful summer games of some version. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, folks need to, to be able to plan and we can't wait until, you know, um, you know, the last minute to make a decision on it. So um, again, these are all, it, uh, these are sources of information. Um, and, and the area leaders are one incredibly important source of information and source of input, not the only one, but um, uh, a source of, of information to consider. Uh, I encourage you um, uh, not to convene an in-person meeting, but <laughs> I encourage you to talk with uh, key folks in your, in your areas uh, and come with, um, uh, with your thoughts uh, and considerations around these dimensions. Um, there may be some other questions that come up, but I think these kind of get at the core information um, uh, of, of what we might need and, and input we would need. That said, we certainly, as I mentioned, certainly are getting, are looking to get additional information, and additional input. We may do a survey with coaches, depending upon, you know, which direction a lot of things go. We also uh, will be working with Jason uh, and Adam and the um, uh, Athlete Input Council or potentially other sources to um, 
uh, gather some additional information and uh, get from the athlete as a key, uh, a key stakeholder here that we want to consider. So um, not a situation I think any of us uh, ever thought we would be in or would, uh, would ever want to be in, um, but uh, we're here nonetheless. And uh, it's not just us, it's many other states that are looking to do that. We certainly will have, uh, there's actually a, a conference call with um, uh, several other sports folks or from around the country, actually from all across North America uh, in a week and a half, I think. And we'll uh, probe on what, uh, how other folks are making decisions just to get some input that way. Um, but yeah, so with, I'm not, when I ask for questions on this, I'm not looking to get your input on those particular items. What I would ask is, uh, is there any other um, question beyond these that you think is critical that folks should consider uh, in, um, in looking to um, uh, provide information? Uh, again, we'll have Saturday and some mechanisms to actually get your input on these dimensions. Um, but tonight is, um, or if there's any question in terms of clarity of something I explained as far as this issue goes, uh, that you would like further clarification. And I don't know if anybody's typing, but I don't see anything in the queue at the moment. Just give folks some, maybe another 15 seconds or so. Uh, would Towson be available after that first weekend? Um, so, uh, Bob, what we have, we've spoken with Towson, uh, and they, their response is, we will do whatever we can do to help make this work. That said, there's, um, they have camps, they have other things that may or may not go forward. That's why I'm saying it's not out of the realm, realm of possibility. Um, it's certainly something that we could explore if that's something that, um, uh, could feasibly be done. It may be that their sports facilities are available or some of them are available, but not lodging, in which case then we may have to look at, uh, at one day competitions. Um, so, um, so yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I hope folks know, I wouldn't put something up there that's sort of like a red herring or whatever that would never come to pass. Um, but uh, yeah, we were actually very pleasantly surprised um, when uh, we got that answer uh, and it's, truly in keeping with the partnership um, uh, relationship that we have with Towson. Uh, Mike, what would qualifying compromise? Can't answer that right now. That's something, but that's a good question that we would need to figure out. Um, uh, you know, would it be one competition? Would it be whatever? So um, that's a good question that I'll, uh, we'll add to the, to the mix. We obviously would, would be flexible, uh, and um, but at the same time, don't want to undercut the, the core principles of the organization of uh, training and competition. We've come a long way from what could, uh, by today's standards, could, would be called field days of the 70s and 80s, uh, and really wouldn't want to, um, to go back to that even for one year. Okay, great. I don't see anything else there. Um, so again, we'll add that to the mix. Uh, and uh, Jeff, I'll ask you if you could to add that to the slide before you send it out. Uh, some additional discussions for Saturday. Um, we were really excited <laughs> to potentially announce or to announce uh, on Saturday about a, a great donation that would have had a major impact on housing uh, and uh, associated registration fees. Um, that's sort of up in the air now, given the, um, the, the situation that we're in. Um, but uh, we did want to talk about housing if we go forward and uh, uh, what folks would want. Uh, I mentioned about the Summer Games nominations. We'll have um, much of uh, the REACH report for 2019 uh, done by that point and be able to share that. I did want to talk through coach education and certification where we're at uh, and looking at particularly during this period where we can't have um, uh, in-person meetings as we're respecting the CDCs and SOIs and the governor's um, request to, um, to minimize uh, in-person uh, contact, um, but uh, uh, looking at potentially uh, creating a, um, a course, a version of coaching Special Olympics athletes 
um, that mirrors the live course, but is done online. Um, a lot of folks I've heard, I shouldn't say a lot, some folks I've heard, um, find while very informative that uh, the straight online learning version of coaching Special Olympics athletes, even though it has videos and other stuff, um, doesn't have the interactivity and the, uh, the ability to meet new coaches and such. So looking at doing some of that, pulling from my previous life in uh, adult learning to, um, to make that happen. And then again, um, so we talked about summer games in the, what I hope is highly unlikely, but still possible uh, situation that the, uh, uh, the current um, uh, situation extends beyond the summer game season. Um, you know, uh, what similar types of things do we need to look at? Uh, the next state sanctioned or state sponsored sport would be kayaking, uh, followed by golf, uh, and um, you know, just kind of figuring out what we need to figure out there, uh, given that this is our, um, our only, uh, I was going to say in person, uh, but <laughs> our only currently scheduled major meeting for this kind of discussion uh, it, it, between now and July. So not that we couldn't plan something if we needed to, but want to at least start that discussion. So um, I think that covers everything in terms of for Saturday. Then wanted to highlight, um, Jeff, you can go to the next slide. So um, Melissa Kelly, uh, who unfortunately could not join us this evening, um, wanted to share and again, put this forward before we found ourselves in our current situation. But uh, the motor activities program, uh, motor activities training program, uh, which you can see some examples there. Um, it's, uh, we are thrilled with the fact that it was in, in many ways um, created in Prince George's County. Um, it's been the, the home and the, the expertise of that for many, many years uh, under the, um, the leadership of Bob Janice and Marty Block and several other folks. Um, but uh, we are, uh, Melissa has had some success working with some area programs to expand it. Jeff, you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, so right now, uh, Prince George's County and Baltimore City both have this um, uh, as a fairly extensive program, particularly Prince George's County in the school system. Baltimore City has had it, um, we think uh, Bear School and a couple others may still have it, um, but looking potentially to, to grow that. Um, there's also a program at uh, Cedar Lane in Howard County. There may be others beyond that, and Anne Arundel is pulling some stuff together with that. Uh, and then in Carroll County, actually, um, oh, actually, it's at the bottom there. In Carroll County, they have introduced it uh, in an adult center um, uh, uh, with uh, some success. Uh, if you go to the next slide, so Melissa is very interested in talking with anyone uh, who has um, connections with adult centers. Um, again, they have the resources, they have the facilities, they have the coaches. In many cases, they may have the actual equipment that potentially could be used for this. Uh, the other part too is uh, since in many cases, the students never leave the center, there is not a need for um, uh, a medical for that individual. Uh, it, it's in essence a program of the center if it's introduced, uh, Special Olympics is providing support for it, um, but because of that, there's not a need for a medical. Uh, of course, if they do go to a more, um, to some type of a culminating event offsite or hosted by Special Olympics, that would be a different situation. So um, there's a great opportunity, a great way to potentially get back into your program. Uh, some athletes maybe who have dropped off over the years as their, um, their physical capabilities maybe have, have changed. Uh, but uh, Melissa would be more than happy to have a conversation with you uh, going forward on that. Uh, then also sharing, uh, Jeff, you can go to the next slide. Um, I think it's this next one. Oh, okay, so more, um, and again, the school program, uh, all schools are closed down right now. Uh, we're not sure when things are gonna kick up with that and if they, when they open the schools, whether interscholastic sports will kick up, we'll begin again at that standpoint. It's our expectation that unify, uh, interscholastic unified sports would mirror whatever happens with uh, any kind of varsity or JV program, but there's a lot of unknowns. That said, once uh, it does uh, kick up or begin again, uh, there's a great opportunity at their various competitions um, uh, to have a, uh, to provide information to, um, to students 
uh, Jimmy Tadlock, many of you know him. Um, I didn't realize this until I saw this, that he was an IUS athlete, athlete uh, back at Old Mill. Um, so, but uh, has moved into and transitioned in the community program. Great opportunity for additional athletes. There's also now, Melissa's had some success and it's growing uh, within middle schools. Um, obviously they could transition to their high school, but they may be interested in other sports that you're offering uh, at the county level or at the community uh, level uh, and could be uh, some great opportunities. Lots of bocce is played in here too. So I know that's a popular sport for folks. So um, this is just once things gear up again, uh, whenever that may be, want to be sure folks are aware of, of this as a uh, um, as an option uh, and, and as a source of additional athletes and, and promotion. And then Jeff, I think the next one is the uh, the banners. Yeah. So and what I don't know is costs associated with this or the exact sizes. My guess is there's some variation. But Melissa, as you can see here, pulled these together for Montgomery County, uh, but getting banners um, for official training sites um, there. Uh, not sure the gentleman in the top one, but Mr. Joe Wu down in the bottom one. So as you can see, um, have the ability to customize by pictures for your area, which, uh, which version of the logo or the shield is on there and such. So um, this is something that Melissa uh, is happy to coordinate uh, and you can reach out to her uh, with that. It's a, it's a great way to have a, a banner that you, assuming the facility lets you, you can leave up and um, promote your program even when you're not actually training there, um, you know, throughout the week. That said, I think the next slide starts. I, if yes, I can yes. just say one more thing about that, this is a great way, um, in addition to advertising for your program, uh, we have a lot of great host sites, sites that donate facilities, um, give us, you know, huge discounts who are, you know, just like as Mike was talking about Towson, who are true partners in our program. Um, so this is a great way um, for you to kind of reward a great host site um, and talking to them about being, you know, the training site for this sport in for this county um, for Special Olympics. So um, again, great way to advertise, but also a great way to recognize um, a great host site that you that you've been working with. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so if there's no questions on that and I don't see any in there. Uh, I'll, uh, Jeff, if you can unmute Mac, I, yep, she's on there. And we'll turn it over to Mac for the next uh, couple slides cool. about young athletes. Exciting. All right. Cool. Mackenzie, I'm, I'm going to unmute you. So um, there you go. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you guys are all staying safe and healthy and um, aren't going stir crazy because it's been like four hours for me and I'm already picking up random things and throwing it across the room. Um, but uh, I wanted to give you guys a quick update for young athletes. Um, although schools are closed for the next two weeks and um, hopefully we probably are seeing that it will be longer, um, we have some things that are kind of going to the wayside, not necessarily wayside, but just adjusted timelines and such um, for our school programming. But uh, if we want to head to the next slide, Jeff, um, I just really wanted to start off with some positives, um, especially, I didn't even plan this, but starting off with some positives um, for our young athletes program for both um, a parent and a teacher. So um, Emily Clauser, who has been a trailblazer out of Frederick County Public Schools, um, was able to provide that we had a student in one of the pilot programs for young athletes who could not take a step independently. He worked hard in physical therapy and continued to push himself in YAP and is now independently able to walk and participate in PE. Um, and I remember when I got, we got this text and it was a FaceTime and they were all so excited, um, not only the educators, but a lot of his peers were, um, it was like a the most uh, joyful and it was just so much of a um, team atmosphere in the classroom that was able to be fostered through young athletes. Um, and then for our families that have been impacted through Anne Arundel County, the Rath family, uh, YAP has given our family more than we could have ever imagined walking into the gym nearly four years ago from physical exercise an opportunity for quality family time and lots of smiles. It has been life-changing and 
Um, hopefully you guys were able to see a bit of the Wrath family through our young athletes um, plunge. We were able to really engage them um, for probably a good five to six months prior to the plunge. Um, and it was amazing for them not only to kind of see the inner workings of Special Olympics, but also what um, their young athletes uh, can strive for if they continue to stay involved in Anne Arundel's programming. Um, and then we can move on to the next slide, Jeff. Perfect. So I'm a really big numbers person. Um, I think that it helps to visualize everything and to kind of have a um, sense of where we've been and where we're going. So currently, our numbers are right there. We're at 3,748 young athletes. Um, and when we say young athletes, that's going to be students with and without. So the actual more intricate breakdown of that is out of the 3,748 young athletes, um, 1,374 of them are identified as having an intellectual disability. Um, and that is alongside their unified partners um, at 2,373. So um, it is quite amazing. Uh, we really are enjoying seeing that kind of 60-40 split. Uh, we want to get as close to inclusive, that true 50-50 inclusivity, um, but we are, we are doing really great in the 12 local school systems that we are currently active in, where uh, our reach is 95 elementary schools, and I think one of my favorite statistics is throughout those 95 elementary schools, we're in 297 classrooms. So it's a lot of not just one-off classrooms here and there in one school. We're really trying to build young athletes to be an organic experience for um, the entire school. So the more classrooms that participate, the bigger that that culture will shift for an inclusive generation. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. So this is kind of um, the more interesting part for us here for the um, area director. So we're currently in five uh, community programs. So um, Anne Arundel has been uh, outstanding with the leadership of Janice Jank, um, who also is now on the um, games management team for Anne Arundel County, the, the local management team. So we really love seeing our coaches be able to kind of take a more active role, role on the management team and have uh, more conversations regarding young athletes and getting them involved in the conversations a bit more. Um, we also have two programs in Baltimore County. So we unfortunately were supposed to start one this past Saturday um, under some new uh, leadership from Towson University with our intern program. Um, and then on the 30th, we were actually going to have another program start for Baltimore County up in Pikesville. Um, so we really are enjoying to see how different counties are really taking into consideration distance and uh, being able to not have a family drive for more than 20 minutes um, to receive a service. So we really praise Baltimore County's uh, leadership and kind of their bootstraps that they just pull them up and they get things done. Um, so hopefully those two programs will be up and running um, whenever it is safe to do so and it is in the best interest of our young athletes and their families. Uh, Carol, Carol, Frederick, and Howard are all currently um, having programming as well. Um, they all mimic very much our seasonal um, our seasons for our sports so that that transition from young athletes into community sports, the expectation is there for our parents. Um, and hopefully that makes our uh, expectations moving forward for all parents um, in the community just well known and clear from the get go. Um, and then just those local school system numbers. So I think that, you know, as much as we've grown with young athletes and we've really seen the program speak for itself, um, there's a lot of work to still be done. Uh, we're really, our scope is only half of where we could be. Um, and especially with that community program. We are at five out of 24. So um, I think that as the school program continues to grow, um, I'm hoping that our community uh, area directors and um, just our community partners want to um, engage our young athletes uh, a bit earlier. Um, I will love to say um, for Washington County, uh, they invited me to their management team meeting two weeks ago. And we had a really great candid conversation about what it could look like to start a young athletes program. Um, I very much so want to be supportive and create rapport with not only your management teams, um, but everyone that's involved in young athletes. Um, it's a team effort and we really want to make sure that we have the capacity and we have the bandwidth and we have the enthusiasm um, to really sustain young athletes moving forward. 
Um, so like I always say, I am always available text, call, or email for young athletes. Um, it brings me more joy than most things. So, uh, even if you aren't interested in starting a program and you just want to talk about the joy of children, I am, uh, your gal. And I think that that's about it for young athletes. I'm pretty sure Jeff. Oh, and then our new and improved looks. How could I forget? Um, we were able to put together a 147-page um, host manual. So um, what you see in front of you is kind of an overview of the new materials that we we're able to get um, as recipients of an amazing grant from the Maryland State Department of Education. And what I really love about the new trajectory that Young Athletes has is that in that host manual, um, it can be used by a teacher because it includes our lesson plans for the school curriculum. Um, it can be used for the community program and our coaches. If you look to the right, um, you kind of see just the breakdown of what this interactive workbook looks like. Um, and then it's amazing, too, because it can be used at home with our parents. Um, there's an activity guide included. There are some uh, creative ways to use household items as equipment. Um, so it's a really a all-in-one uh, interactive workbook that we really want our families our our, uh, our profession our school professionals and our community members to um, utilize and uh, the more that we utilize it the more that people will know about young athletes so I think that that's it but sometimes I surprise myself there we go um, so questions concerns I'm always up for discussion um, I love to laugh in the face of roadblocks and adversities um, and I'm also, and you know, going to have a lot of, uh, alone time. So if anyone wants to talk or chat about young athletes, I am available at all hours. Um, and that's my contact information down below. Awesome. Thanks Mackenzie. We, I don't think we could get a more enthusiastic, um, YAP director. So appreciate <laughs> Uh, taking time to be on the call. Um, Marilyn had a question. She wanted to know if we would be sending out that new um, book to their YAP pro to their YAP person in Howard County. Yep. So Marilyn, Katie, and Ashley both got um, a part one of the host manuals for their school program, um, and they were able to get two for the community. Um, once we kind of get back into the office and get back to our status quo, um, if any community programs want them, just drop me a note and I can send them your way in the mail kind of once everything gets back to um, normal. And then uh, for Bob's question, for um, Howard County, we are uh, in 19 out of, I think that they have 31 elementary schools. Um, but what is really great is that we partnered with the uh, Regional Early Childhood Centers. So we have really great advocates in the Early Childhood Intervention Department. Um, and out of the 31 elementary schools, 19 of them have regional early childhood centers. So um, when there's a regional early childhood center involved, then we are in there. Um, and the Howard County school professionals have been nothing but enthusiastic. And um, that is how we have our two young athlete head coaches for Howard County. So we really see a lot of great success um, in partnering with our schools to then also get them engaged in the community. That's awesome. Thanks, Mac. Um, so Mac's contact information is up there. So if you have any more questions, um, feel free to email her. She'll be, she'll be waiting for your email sitting on her couch. So um, thanks, Mac, for joining us. And we are going to keep moving. Mac, I'm going to put you back on mute, okay? Yep. Cool. All right, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, we are going to keep take a quick uh, look at development. So um, first of all is congratulations. Joanne talked about um, the great plunge that we had this year. It was fantastic. Um, and to all of the credit to our uh, area leadership, um, it's been the most uh, money raised for our area programs uh, than we've seen in previous years. So this year's total was $62,183.10, which is so exciting um, that that's being um, uh, directed straight to the area programs again, uh, thanks to the 70-30 split on the plunge. So um, our big, our big counties this year, Harford County coming through um, with eight, with over eighteen thousand dollars raised through the polar bear plunge. Howard County coming through with over fifteen thousand dollars raised in the plunge. Um, the Lower Shore with over eight thousand. Montgomery County with over six thousand, um, and Baltimore County with over four thousand. If you take a look at the the two big numbers up there. Harford County and Howard County, 
that is uh, because both of those counties took advantage of the unified um, super plunge team uh, that we offered in um, over the summer, I believe, at our summer area directors meeting. So um, again, if you if your county champions a um, local program athlete and volunteer to be a unified uh, super plunge team, one that you identify that's going to be your county's super plunge team, um, we applied the 70-30 split to the money that they bring in. Um, and so I, I know for Harford County, that was a bulk of that $18,000. So that's really exciting. Um, and Howard County, the same. So we, we certainly want to thank uh, Nancy Schmidt and Pat Neary um, and Sue Taylor for champion, champion, championing uh, the Harford County Super Plunge team of Tressa and Stacy Hall. Um, and then Howard County, thanks to Bob Marilyn um, on your uh, on Jackson and McKenna. Um, super plunging for your county. So great job there um, and great job to all of our local programs for a, a really good uh, way to kick off the year with some collaborative fundraising, $62,000 going back to the local programs. That's exciting. Um, last piece uh, with fundraising that, that we did want to bring up and, and queue up for Saturday. We understand that uh, spring events are being canceled. Our inspiration walks are, are being canceled and postponed, uh, which can be stressful for our area leaders. Nate and our development team and me and our region staff, we want to support you. We understand that it can be stressful to take a look at the potential for not having a large fundraiser and start to consider the budget that might, have, might not have revenue coming in. We want to help you, okay? So whether that's a specific language that you're going to use to send out to um, Inspiration Walk participants to let them know about the event being canceled or you want to try a virtual Inspiration Walk rather than an in-person Inspiration Walk, um, we, de we definitely want to help. So um, know that we are um, available. You can definitely get in touch by email um, or phone. Um, the other thing is we're going to be having a discussion on Saturday about how our, our communications and marketing team specifically can be of best service to our local programs and what templates they can provide to you as area leaders so that we're communicating consistent, consistent language across the board about a number of things, about events, about what we're looking with with coronavirus, any of that kind of stuff. So we want to have that discussion. Uh, so start uh, thinking about that. Moving on to some local program information. Uh, first piece that I wanted to bring up, um, we're going to start doing area director agreements, which will be a new annual document to be signed by area directors. Um, this will include um, agreements that are typically signed, things like credit card policies, conflict of interest statements, etc., cetera, um, as well as acknowledgement of um, understanding our financial policies and those types of things. Um, this will be for all area directors, regardless of if you receive a stipend or not as well as any other stipended area leaders that are on your management team. We are not doing this out of concern or people not, you know, far exceeding um, our expectations as area directors. So please do not um, get the wrong idea from this. This is simply a document that our auditors like to see um, that we have not done in the past that we think um, would be important to have. Again, it's going to be bundling a lot of that signed paperwork that you typically do um, with some other um, acknowledgments. Um, on our end. So uh, those are those are to come. Um, I just wanted to get it out in front of you as an FYI and, and to reinforce that this is not being done out of any type of concern, more just a, um, a document that we should have anyway. Um, so that's what's going on with area director agreements. Moving on to health and fitness, um, some exciting stuff happened um, in the late winter. Um, as I've talked about, we had our Healthy Communities grant. We hired Ben Varga, um, our Healthy Communities manager, um, and we got right to work with some unified fitness clubs in Baltimore City. So that was our main project um, that we were looking off, looking for in this in uh, this grant cycle. So we had a six-week program, 35 new participants, and two brand new coaches in the Baltimore City program. It was great. Um, it would, took place with uh, Lakeland uh, Lakeland Elementary School and Graceland Park um, Middle. I'm sorry, Lakeland Middle School and Graceland Park Middle School. Um, it went really well. They did a modified uh, unified strength and conditioning program. Um, they did uh, jump rope, standing long jump, stationary bike, um, and some relay races. 
um, really positive experience for all of the students and the coaches. Um, throughout the program, they did uh, pretty interactive lessons on hydration and nutrition. Um, each student also got a pedometer um, thanks to the grant and they were counting their steps uh, through the whole six week program. So all that to say our, our Healthy Communities program is off to a great start under Ben's leadership. Um, and also to put out that if you are interested in starting um, a unified fitness club in your county, um, please be in touch with me and, and Ben and we'll talk a little bit more about this on Saturday, but um, we would love to see more unified fitness clubs pop up. Um, fitness is gonna be central to our health program. Um, as we are looking to expand our health offerings, we want it to be very active, we want it to be very engaging, and we want it to be very fun. So it's gonna be about fitness, not necessarily other forms of health. Um, while we'll still have healthy athletes, we want our athletes moving, okay? So be in touch if you are interested in starting a unified fitness club when we can uh, start having programming again. Staying on that note, um, obviously during our program suspension, um, our athletes can't practice, they can't train in, you know, in our traditional sense. So um, a team of us got together and we're going to be offering um, at-home fitness opportunities in which your athletes uh, can participate, which we're really excited about. We think it's going to be a lot of fun. We would encourage you and your volunteers to participate as well. So the plan is going to be on Mondays through our social media channels. We're going to post a short exercise video led by an SOMD athlete, staff member, or volunteer. Um, it'll be on Facebook, Twitter, um, and Instagram, and it'll be a, a relatively short and simple exercise routine. Athletes and volunteers can post a picture or video of them doing that exercise in the comment section. And then uh, as they do more of those, they'll be eligible to win prizes through our Healthy Athletes and, and Healthy Communities program. Um, so I think we've got a few lined up. We're excited to say that uh, some coaches at Towson University and some student athletes are gonna get involved in, in uh, helping us with some videos as well. So that's gonna be on Mondays. Again, look for some, some exercise videos on our social media. On Fridays, uh, Ben, our Healthy Communities Manager, is going to lead a Friday Fit Five Club, which is going to be a group workout held over Zoom every Friday at noon. Um, so Fit Five has these great fitness cards um, that look at strength, flexibility, and endurance. And so we're going to work our way through those cards with Ben and some of our health messengers leading the activities. Um, and so this is for athletes, for volunteers, and I'm sure we're going to get a few SOMD staff members to join us. Um, at noon as well for a little exercise break during the day. All of this is just to keep our athletes engaged, involved, and active in this, kind of, in this odd pause that we now have in our sports season. So we're going to be sending out more information. Be on the lookout for this, but um, we think it's going to be a lot of fun, um, and we'd, we'd love to see some of your videos and pictures, and if you have some time on, at noon on Fridays, definitely join our fitness club as well. Um, not seeing any questions. I'm going to keep moving. Um, our, oh, I'm sorry, not 1121, 321. Sorry about that. Um, our meeting on Saturday is obviously going to look a little different um, than it typically does. So we're going to have a two part teleconference via Zoom. This is Zoom. Um, it will go from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., we'll take an hour break. And then we'll be from 1 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Ending time to be determined. Um, it won't go past 3.30, um, but um, we'll, we'll keep it as succinct, succinct and efficient as we can. As, as we typically do, uh, breaks will be worked in throughout the day, so you don't have to worry about sitting at your desk um, you know, for, for three hours and two and a half hours straight. Um, you'll be able to get up and get moving a little bit. We will be using um, breakout rooms through Zoom. So part of our um, area director meetings has been focused on discussion. We wanna hear from you, we wanna hear feedback. We've queued up some topics for you. Um, so we're gonna be utilizing breakout rooms um, for small group discussion. Uh, so because of that, we would like you to join by your computer if you can. Um, a, a, a phone is fine, uh, but the computer is gonna be much more interactive. Um, the other thing, uh, unlike 
uh, tonight when I was deactivating cameras. Um, we're going to ask you to please activate your camera um, if you can. That way we can make it even more interactive. We can see faces um, and we can have more uh, in-person discussion um, that we think is going to lead to um, a much more fulfilling and interactive experience. We are going to uh, set it so that you can unmute yourself, um, but that also means that you have to remute yourself. Um, for the sake of the meeting and the sake of our discussions, it's going to be best if people can remember to unmute themselves to say what they need to or ask their question and then put themselves back on mute just to um, avoid any background noise. The nice part about um, having a meeting over this format is that we'll be able to record the whole um, meeting just like we did um, with this meeting and then send out that recording um, to those who couldn't join us. I did send out the registration links um, or the registration link uh, this morning. Um, so please take a minute to register for the meeting. Um, and again, it'll start at nine o'clock. The first part will go till noon. Then we'll take a lunch break. I'm not sending Panera to your house. You have to get your own Panera or lunch of your choice. Um, and then uh, we'll start again at one o'clock. So any questions before I move on about the meeting format for uh, this Saturday? Awesome. All right, so just to wrap up really quickly, some of the major topics that we're gonna take a look at um, to queue up discussion. Um, 2022 USA games, like we talked about, Mike's gonna do some check-in on coach education. Um, and certainly the bulk of the conversation, I think will be about the 2020 spring season um, that we should currently be in um, and how, how we move forward there. On the local programs uh, side, we're gonna look at uh, the program opportunities that are available to local programs and essentially how we can get our athletes to play more, right? We've been talking a lot about growth in the school program and, and, and you know, as you've seen, McKenzie's going gangbusters on uh, the young athletes program. So it's time to start thinking creatively about how we can infuse more athletes into our community program. And it might not be in the, in the traditional sense of Special Olympics, you know, eight week training plus competition. We have a lot of, we have a lot of options out there. So we want to talk about those. From the development standpoint, um, how can SOMD staff support your, your fundraising efforts this spring? Um, we'll have a good discussion there. Uh, Nate will be joining us. Um, and what are, what are the communication tools and templates um, that would be useful uh, for you all as area leaders to have? Again, think broadly, specifically about um, COVID-19, um, but certainly other, other type of, of branding that we can make sure we have consistency of brand and language. Um, the last piece that we'll be talking about is um, our 50th anniversary celebration, and uh, as much time as we've been spending talking about the uh, coronavirus, uh, we're also going to be kicking off our 50th anniversary year. Um, so we are excited um, for that. And, and lastly, as, as we've uh, had at our last meeting, we're going to be looking forward to an Athlete Input Council report. Uh, they will report out on uh, their work since the last meeting. Um, as well as take ideas for the upcoming Athlete Input Council meeting. Um, so, any questions about what we're looking at for Saturday? Great. Now, as, uh, as I unmute Jim to say uh, he can close it out, I do need to say I was, I was typing to the wrong person, and I told Bob Baker that he would have uh, he would be closing us out this evening, so uh, I, I apologize to Bob. You're not going to be able to do that speech that you wrote for um, closing out this meeting. So, Jim, I'm going to unmute you, and there you go. Thanks, Jeff. I just want to uh, thank everybody for taking the time to be with us this evening and, and for the interaction uh, during this really challenging time. Um, obviously, we're facing uh, unprecedented uh, circumstances as it relates to the COVID-19 um, and as you heard uh, this evening, you know, we're proceeding. It's certainly not business as usual, but we want to stay focused um, on our athletes and ensuring that we can work closely with you as it relates to giving them the most meaningful experiences possible. So uh, you heard a couple of things. Jeff uh, mentioned the, the fitness piece. 
Um, I think you'll, there's more to come on that. We're really sensitive to the experience that our athletes are having, uh, the importance of Special Olympics in their lives, both from a, a physical fitness um, perspective, an enjoyment perspective as it relates to the training and competition, and certainly the social piece that they experience on a weekly basis when they go to practice um, and when they come to the qualifying events and so forth. So um, given the significant void that uh, is resulting from the COVID-19, we're looking for ways to interact with athletes. And so this fitness piece to which Jeff referred is, is one of those elements. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Jason Schrimmel's efforts uh, over the last, uh, I guess, five to seven days with regard to pulling together an athlete leadership um, webinar, uh, a couple of webinars uh, for athlete leadership in COVID-19. And we had um, over 20 athletes join him for those, which I think was positive. Um, so as you think about this, if, if you have ways that you think we can further engage our athletes that uh, you believe would be meaningful, please do not hesitate to share those uh, thoughts with us. Um, obviously, Saturday is an opportunity to do that as well. Um, with that, I, again, I just want to thank you for your ongoing leadership and commitment uh, with your local programs. I want to thank our staff uh, from Jason to McKenzie to Jeff and Mike uh, and Joanne for being on the call this evening um, and providing the, the interaction and the, the insight that we hope is valuable. So thanks everybody and look forward to talking to you again. Uh, we've got, uh, Jeff, you may be getting to this, but we are gonna continue our, our COVID calls. Um, so we've got that tomorrow and then again, we'll see you on Saturday. So Jeff, I'll turn it back to you, thank you. Great, thanks Jim. Um, and again, just echoing Jim's thanks for your leadership, your time tonight um, and uh, you know, spending so much time uh, on webinars and calls with our staff um, related to kind of the challenging and unprecedented situation that we're in. So uh, we certainly do appreciate that as a reminder. Um, Bob, thanks for the um, thanks for the clarification. The COVID call is Wednesday, not tomorrow. Um, so we'll see everybody on Wednesday uh, who can make it. Um, just as a reminder, our staff has transitioned to working remotely. Um, folks collected their things uh, that they needed from the office today and, and will be in uh, remote work mode. So I will be sending out the um, staff contact list uh, this evening that was updated. So that's ready to go out. Um, we will remain as accessible to you as we can be. Um, some of our folks are getting used to working remotely. Um, so it might take a, a day or two just to get in the get back in the group. But um, definitely whatever you need, we are uh, here to support. So uh, thanks again for your time tonight. This recording will be sent out as will uh, the staff contact list. We'll see you Wednesday for the COVID call and then Saturday for our area directors meeting. Thanks everybody.